just wondering, are there any Liverpool fans here tonight? Well, as you probably know, we're here to celebrate the 27th anniversary of Red All Over the Land. The longest running and the only surviving Liverpool fanzine. For 27 years, fans have been buying the fanzine on match days, home and away and people have been subscri uh, subscribing to it from all over the world. It's also written by the fans as well. It is the true voice of the fans. And along that time, it has also raised thousands of pounds for charities. And tonight we're raising money for Abby Lawn's charity, which is a care home very, very close to, to where we are now. You'll find out more about that a little bit later on. My name's Graham Mack. I have, used to have a regular radio show on Radio Merseyside a couple of years ago. I've also worked on radio stations all over the UK. I'm not bragging because most of them sacked me. <laughs> <laughs> and these days I'm an audio book narrator. So uh, that's where we're at. But I wanted to mention that because it's how I got to meet John Beerman because around about 20 years ago I was hosting the breakfast show on Century Radio in the East Midlands and I read a piece from Red All Over the Land on the air and later on tonight I'll introduce you to the bloke who wrote that piece because I've actually never met him in person yet either you'll find out more about that a little bit later on so I read this piece on the air and then the, the on-air phone line went and a bloke rang up and said, you just read something from Red All Over the Land. My name's John Peterman and I'm the editor. And that's how we met and we've been friends ever since. I'd like to bring him up here now. He's the man who started it. The man who will probably finish it, but he's not finished just yet. Would you please give a, a warm welcome to John Peterman. Thank you very much. Um, running the fanzine has been a pleasure and what we're doing tonight is an even greater pleasure because um, Abbey Lawns, a couple of yards down the road, have got around 40 residents and what we're doing tonight is trying to help those 40 residents have a little bit of a better Christmas and whatever we raise in this room tonight through the auction the raffle uh, and the raffle then that all goes to the to the residents home the residential home when i started the fanzine i didn't expect it to continue for 27 years i, I thought about five but um doing the fanzine has introduced me to a lot of people but at that time there was i think uh, three other fanzines uh, doing the rounds. One of them uh, stayed around for about another 15 odd years and that's Dave Usher from the Liverpool Way. Dave's here tonight with his dad Eddie and Eddie used to stand close to me and we used to see who was selling the most. <laughs> um, and we had a couple of guys that's been with me for now over 20 years. They've become close friends, good friends and all as well as good Liverpool fans. One of them is Steve Hales, who's over there, and uh, he's been selling the fanzine outside the Banfield now since I think 2000, before 2000, and he's there every week, unless he's on holiday, he goes on a lot of those cruises now. Um, so he, he's, he does, it's where he learns his jokes, and that's the bad news. So there's Steve there, there's another lad, Martin, who's not with us tonight, but then there's my good friend here, Andy Knott, who uh, has been, I met her, Andy outside Main Road when Manchester City were poverty stricken and they're also going to get relegated the very same day and Andy said to me, you've used one of my pictures and I said, well who are you? and he said, well, I'll print them, a printer, he got a job <laughs> So, it's um, no longer prints it, but then again, he's semi-retired, aren't you, Andy? Uh, so, um, so, people I've met 
just doing the fanzine has been amazing. And also in other people like Wally and Karen who are just, uh, just here again. Met, met them on the way to a rather horrendous night in Basel, I think it was, where we got knocked out of the European Cup. But uh, yeah, we've stayed friends and um, that, that's what it's always been about. I've always said, it's not what you achieve in life, sometimes it's about the people you achieve it with. We've all achieved quite a lot. When Red All Over the Land started, it went on sale on November the 18th, 1995. And uh, it rained. It's a similar theme. And we were playing Everton. On that day, Everton beat us 2-1. I thought we were a bit unlucky, but anyway, we, we lost. And we've got an Everton fan here tonight. Uh, but the thing, <laughs> the, thing, the, thing, the thing about it is, on that day, Everton were FA Cup holders. Liverpool were League Cup holders. Since that day, Liverpool, I think, have won 18 more trophies. I can't be sure, but I don't think Everton have done that well. <laughs> so... I, I like to think I, I put a curse on Everton on the way home that day. I mean, yeah, it works. Must be the gypsy blood from my Irish connections. So anyway, I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to hand you back to Graham. But thank you for coming along. Please support Abby Lawrence tonight. That's what it's all about. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here for a night of celebration. As uh, the lads have said, the 27th birthday of Red All Over the Land. And congratulations again to John Bloom for that great feat. Now, before I welcome the two Anfield legends who are going to talk to you tonight, um, I think we must also mark the passing this week, the very sad one, of one of Merseyside football's great characters, David Johnson. Who at the age of 71. David was nicknamed the Doc by Terry McDermott because he always had throat and headache tablets in his kit bag. And Terry said, you've got more than my doctor. And that's how it stuck. But he left behind a string of career landmarks, scoring on his debuts at every level, from youth team to European Cup to his first club, Everton. He then went, uh, thank you very much, you're better at rehearsal. <laughs> For his first club Everton and after a period at Ipswich he was signed by Bob Paisley for Liverpool in the summer of 1976 and went on to score 78 goals in 213 appearances winning four league title medals, two European Cups, a League Cup and a European Super Cup and he and Peter Beardsley are the only two players to score for both Everton and Liverpool in Mersey derbies. So can we just raise a glass in David's memory to David Johnson. Let's do this. Now we're in a marquee and I'm certain that we've got two marquee guests to introduce. I know, I tried. I tried. <laughs> I'm introducing them in alphabetical order. Our first guest used to stand on the cop as a youngster, hero worshiping, worshiping Roger Hunt, and he worked as an apprentice toolmaker at a car factory in Speak before beginning a remarkable football career that saw him overtake, and this is a stat I didn't know till recently, saw him overtake Jimmy Greaves to score more goals than any English-born player ever has. An amazing total of 476 goals in 896 games for his five clubs and at international level for the Republic of Ireland. That's a remarkable average of a goal every 1.8 games. At Liverpool, he won a league title medal in 1988, an FA Cup medal in 1989 and set a record of scoring in 10 consecutive top flight games between 86-87 and 87-88. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a goal scorer extra northern air, it's older himself, John Aldridge. Now joining John um, is the only man to play under the only two player managers 
in the history of Everton and Liverpool, namely Howard Candle and Kenny Dalglish. He also captained both Mersey clubs in a career that embraced 508 league appearances for five clubs, weighing in with 48 goals, and he also won 17 caps for England. Three league titles and two FA Cups with Liverpool. Ladies and gents, that tigerish midfielder himself, Steve McMahon. £350,000 in September 1985 as Kenny Dalglish's first signing. But I'm told that when you left for Villa, Liverpool were also in for you. Can you tell us that story? Is that true? Yes, I can. That's what made for us, John. But the first thing I want to do is correct you. When he, he must have been on Wikipedia. Go on. When he said 48 goals, it's actually 50 goals. So it's 50. I do apologise. It's okay. It's only two, two goals in it. So no, no, it's important. Um, two against Everton, probably. <laughs> so it's 50 goals for Liverpool, and a lot more for, for the other clubs I played for. So yes, so yeah, I could have signed for Liverpool straight from Everton. And as you all know, I was, I'm from this part of the world and uh, just across the road from uh, uh, Old Oak where we used to fight each other, Garston, Elwood. <laughs> and, uh, and so I grew up uh, as an Evertonian. All my family are Evertonians. And to this day, they still don't like me. <laughs> so I played for Everton when I was a ball boy and I went through, I did my dream by playing for the club that I wanted to play for. And then I realised I needed to be successful. <laughs> There's no point playing for 10 years and win a fuck all, is there? <laughs> and so I decided, and when Everton supporters ask me, and they go, why do you leave? And I go, well, do you remember the game? When Rush scored one, Rush scored two, Rush scored three, and Rush scored four. <laughs> well, I played for fucking Everton that day. <laughs> so, how dare they even question why I wanted to play for Everton? And on that occasion, do you remember Glenn Keeley? Well, he made his debut. He was on loan from Derby, uh, from uh, Blackburn Rovers, and Howard brought him in on loan from from Blackburn Rovers, and he played 30 odd minutes. And it was nil nil. He got sent off, pulling Kenny Dalglish back, and that was his sending off. And we lost five nil. But the best thing about it is, if he'd have stayed on, he'd have been eight. <laughs> it was that shit. It was unbelievable. Seriously, he never played again. He never played again for Everton. That was the end of him. Anyway, what was the question, John? How many goals did you score out here, Steve? 48. Ah, I got it wrong, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I could have signed for, for, for Liverpool, but I'd agreed with Aston Villa and I, I spoke to Bob Paisley, me and my dad. And I thought the occasion for me, go sorry from Everton to Liverpool was wrong for a career move. Not financially, because uh, I, I could have made a lot more money, which is not documented in, in the, the reason why I left uh, Everton. Everyone thought I left for money, it wasn't, it wasn't a case of that. It was for my career moving forward. And thankfully, I got the opportunity to come back to this amazing football club, Liverpool. Yeah. I always remember, I always remember going out the door with Bob Paisley, me and my dad, and I, I said thank you, I appreciate it, but I think I need to move away to get myself sorted. Go to Aston Villa, and Bob Paisley said, don't worry son, you'll be back at this football club sooner than what you think. And I remember them words as if it was yesterday. 18 months later, I get a call. And it went something like this. He went, I hear you, I hear you. Are you? We man. 
And I thought, it would have. Let's say some of them. So, roughly that translated to, would you like to sign for Liverpool? Roughly. So, I said, yeah, who is it? He said, I can't tell you. <laughs> because it's not confirmed, nothing's... He said, but would you? I said, well, yes, of course. I had a little inclination it was. Anyway, the phone goes down. Five days later, it's all over the press. Kenny Aglish is the new Liverpool player manager. And I thought to myself, that must have been him now. <laughs> So the phone goes the next day, and it's this Scottish fellow. I can't tell you his name because he'll sue me. And all the one was a score about uh, Kenny sues everybody who says anything against him. <laughs> so he says, That's why he brings me, and he said, That's why I couldn't tell you. It wasn't common knowledge, but I'm going to ask you again, will you, do you want to be my first signer for the club? And when King Kenny asks you that question, then. It was a no-brainer. After 18 months, I'd sign a, a five-year contract with him. So I just said to Kenny, um, sorry, although I'm, I'll try and make this as quick as possible, because I know he needs to go to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> so I just said to Kenny, yes, no problem. I said, but the only problem, I, I've got one problem. I've signed a, a, a five-year contract and I've got three and a half years left on it. I said, what do you do? How do you go about it? And he went, easy, just blame your wife. <laughs> this is Kenny's mentality, and I said, okay, yeah, I agree with that, no problem, I'll blame you, miss. So, I said, how? He went, just say she cries every time we come home from training and matches. I said, yeah, she does. Right? <laughs> Whenever I come home, she cries. End of. So, he went, seriously, he said, just say she's home, sir. She needs to get back to the northwest quickly, because she can't stand it. I said, I live an hour and five minutes away in the car. <laughs> Which he did. To hell would, it was like one hour, five minutes. <clears throat> so he said, listen, <clears throat> not going to beat her around the bush. If you want to sign for Liverpool, that's what you have to do. I said, okay, I'll try. <clears throat> Goes in the next day, speaks to the chairman, speaks to the manager, and I, I hit him with this. <clears throat> God, I'm devastated. I love this football club. <laughs> As you do. A lot of shit, isn't it? Of shit. I said, but I've got to, I've got to get back to the north first because my missus. Sad. I know it is sad, and, but uh, you know, if she's not happy, I'm not happy, and I won't be able to give my best and all that bullshit that you, you get, you know? So, <clears throat> he went. Deadly dog, and the you went, we understand, we empathise, we understand. Brilliant, family comes first, family is good, no problem, leave it with us. Oh no, thanks for understanding. I went out and went, fuck you, get in there, that was good. That, that wasn't hard. <clears throat> so, I've done the, the dastardly deed. Three days later, I see this Rolls Royce coming down the driveway at Bodymore Heath, Aston Villa's training ground. And it's deadly dope. And he never comes to the training ground, so I'm thinking, fucking happy days, something's happened, you know? As you do. Jump. As you do. As you do. As you do. So, coming down the driveway, I'm thinking, yeah, this is it. Something being done, sorted. Next thing you get, smack it in. I'm training with the first team, obviously, and I'm runs in. I've got my, my boots on. I've got my kit, I've got all the shite on me. So, sit down. <coughs> okay, smack it. <coughs> get your bag packed, get your boots, get all your stuff, all your private belongings, everything else. You've got your medical at Old Trafford at one o'clock. <laughs> I've never fell off my fucking seat. Because I was expecting the Liverpool word to come out, you know? And I went, <coughs> took a deep breath and went, um, actually, I wanted to go a bit further northwest than Manchester. So, I kid you not, I almost got thrown out of the office by both the chairman and the manager. So, I goes home and I rings this Scottish fellow back. <laughs> and I, I said, see, you need to sort this out rapidly. I said, otherwise I'm going to have to sign for Manchester United. 
which I, I was boxed into a corner because that's North West. Uh, anyway, I became a Liverpool footballer within 48 hours. And apart from saying no to Manchester United, it was the best thing he ever did in my football career. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. It was in September 1985. Your, the team was Blue Scrobbler in goal, Phil Neal, Mark Lawrenson, Alan Hansen and Alan Kennedy, a midfield of Jan Mulby, myself and Ronnie Whelan, and a front two of Ian Rush and Craig Johnston, who was standing in for the injured Doug Lish. Now, guess who scored the game's opening goal? John Aldridge. John Aldridge. Oh, obviously being a Liverpool fan, um, this is too fucking short, this man. <laughs> 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 Give us a bit of slack there, please. Oh, okay, go, Pell. There you go. Mind you, alright? Got no lead. Why don't you move around? There you go, Move around. There you go, Pell. Yeah, so um, I remember the game, you know, so vividly. Um, so excited to play against Liverpool. God, that was a Liverpool fan from. From once I remember, you know, you brought up in the city, you had a red and a blue, aren't you? Your dad or whatever. And thankfully, my dad was um, a Liberal fan because I'd, I'd have been the biggest, horriblest, fucking bitter blue old bastard on the planet. And I just loved the club. I used to go home and away on, on you know, on the, uh, the special trains and everything. We used to do all the fighting, all the crap and whatever. I mean, it was mad. Mad in them days. Shanks, Shanks was me, me god. Um, and Sir Roger was, was you know, I idolised him. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to, to, to play for Liverpool. So this was a, an ideal opportunity, as Matt and Macca said, for, for me to, to show Kenny, who was the manager, that I'm not a bad player. Uh, and he scored the opening goal. It was, it was a nice goal. And that was a really well worked header, you know, from about the penalty spot. I, I did all right. Um, we drew 2 2. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, in our house was a fucking mess because about 15 people came and we had a little you know, three bedroom house. 15 people from our family was stuck in there for two or three days and we had great fun. But, but yeah, it That's was. That's just because you got a draw. Yeah. Well, it was the. Oh, it's nice. We only had like 12,000 crowd and we were a small club. Liverpool was fucking great. So, by the way, who scored the first goal ever against Alex Ferguson as a Man United manager? Probably you, but fucking I did. Get in there. <laughs> Get in there, man. No one mentions that one, fellas, eh? Oxford United 2, Manx fucking nil. Get in there, you bastard. Look at every minute of it. Fucking hate them, by the way. Anyway, not good, not good. Um, yeah, so where were we, Jones? <laughs> no, no, it's fine. No, you were talking about Oxford and you didn't yeah. play. Sorry, kids. Any kids? Oh, no. Sorry, no. Sorry, no. I'm sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry you swore. He didn't mean to say Manchester, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, but the, the, the funny stuff's well, eventually got to Liverpool. Mac obviously went a different way from Mac because he was an apprentice at, at, uh, at Everton. Um, I was a tunemaker uh, for British Rail and didn't speak, making. You know, parts with the Dormant Sprint, the TR7, the, the, the Stag, all them great cars in the day. Um, uh, but I did actually go trialling for Liverpool when I was touching 16. Now, it wasn't an academy in them days, it was a development, do you remember? We had the B team, the A team, the Resis, the first team. Remember, we used to do the Pink Echo to look at all the scores, lads, and all that. They had apprenticeships then, didn't they? Uh, yeah, yeah, so. so um, but you know, I went to Ireland for about six weeks um, under, under Tom Saunders. I thought I'd cracked it because I'd done well. Uh, and I remember the, the last day, 50 lads who were hoping to get a, you know, an apprenticeship with Liverpool Football Club sat around Tom, who was a great fella, and he addressed us. And he spoke to us and, and, and then he said, Jeff, well tried, Jeff. Not good enough, but you, you've done well. Keep your head up, son. Harry, brilliant. Harry, see you two weeks time. John, well done son, looked at me and he said, great goal you scored there today against the B team, we'll definitely be giving you a ring. 13 fucking years I waited for that goal. <laughs> that was the phone's improved. <laughs> I was devastated, I was really devastated, but what it did, because 
I just dreamt of wanting to play for Liverpool all my life. It just, I used to write to Shanks and he walked back to me and, and mad mad thing was. Um, and, and yeah, I, I strove and I strove and I always remembered Tom's words in my head and I used them as a motivational weapon. So when I did get a, a, a contract for Newport County from South Liverpool, one year, on less money than what I was to, to make it, when the lads was in the bath or the shower after training, I was out on the pitch working my bollocks off, trying to make myself a better player, you know, and, and when we played this game, obviously against Oxford, I was starting to come into my prime and, and I must have shown some, some, some sort of a, you know, where uh, I made an impact on Kenny because, you know, not the year after he, he came in for me, thankfully, and then, um, and, and we, I mean, yeah, what a team, what a team, and, and Mac, me and Mac, we, we, we got on infamously. Uh, I was, well, I was blessed to be fair to one of the, one of the few people in the world have actually achieved an ambition what to play for people who wanted to when you think about the millions and millions and millions of people have done so and, and the doc god rest his soul he'd done the same as me he used to go home and away so so yeah yeah it was it was, it was fantastic for me did you ever give up hope jim um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was at an age like Matthew you joined what age were you when you joined liverpool then uh, I was 24, I think. Yeah, uh, mid 20. Yeah. I was, I was 20. I think it was 29. Or just something like something 28, 29. Which I was, a, was a late developer because I didn't get into the game until I was 21, more or less. And did they give up? A little bit, but I was with Oxford. Like I was, I was very fortunate because Newport County. Uh, I'm playing against you. Would get there when you play forever, didn't it? Funny enough, you know, uh, we got the. Division 4 promotion, then Oxford, Division 3 promotion, Division 2 promotion, so I went through the leagues, so it was a great way to go. And before that you had a run in Europe at Newport, We did, we got a quarter yeah. final. To That's why he beat Jimmy Greaves' record, because he, he scored an all non league club stand. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Greaves scored at the top level all the time. It's not like your 50 goals, is it, Steve? Not my 48 goals that you've How many years? How many years have you got, Bill? How many years, what, mate? How many years took you to get 40 oh, goals? No, 50 goals. 50, sorry, how many? Well, ten, that was just with Liverpool. Was that 10 years? Yeah, but I'm not a striker. <laughs> ten years. Six, six, six years. Uh, 63 goals in two fucking years, so there you go, anyway. Yeah. 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 Hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah, but that's what you're supposed to do. He made none of them, you know. <laughs> Um, in only your third game for Liverpool, you scored the decisive third goal against Everton to uh, win the game 3-2 at yes, yes, I did. But going on to that game, the debut, it was my debut for, for Liverpool. Oh, the, the Oxford game, yeah. Oxford United away Friday evening, as you do. So we stayed in the hotel and we eat in the dining room separate to the riffraff, as, as Kenny would, would, would say. So we sit in this room and we comes down for dinner and it's a big round table and everyone's sitting there. It's my debut, I've signed on the, 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 the Tuesday or something. So it's Friday evening and little Sammy Lee comes down and he walks in the room and we're all sitting around the table and he goes, this is like the last supper. <laughs> and that's how with Sammy, Sammy is brilliant. Top, top love. So we go, they're like, this is like the Boko Last Supper, eh? Yeah. So I goes, okay, I said, it is for some years. <laughs> uh, I kid you not, I kid you not, right? So when you think about many, many words, spoke, many true words spoken in jest. So I said on the, on the Friday evening before my debut Oxford on the Saturday, it is for some years. We played the game, Saturday, Saturday afternoon, Kenny always named the team an hour before kickoff, never before, so no one knew the team. So he goes, Sammy, you're out, Mackie, you're in. Oh no, fuck me, he didn't. <laughs> Sammy must have thought I knew the team. Must have thought Kenny had told me I'm playing, and I didn't. Uh, I honestly didn't. So I goes to Sammy, he said, sorry, Sam. I said, I didn't know the team, seriously. He went, don't worry about it, I expect it. He said, you come here now. I knew I was going to be dropped for you, no problem. He said, no hard feelings. He said, no, 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 not so. Plays the game. He scores the back and first goal. It's like carnage. 
Ronnie Whelan gets carried off, he's got about eight stitches in his head. John True smashes him. He's got he's he's off, Ronnie Whelan. Rushy has got concussion. He thinks he's playing for fucking Real Madrid. <laughs> To be fair, like, we did have like a meeting team, didn't we? Malcolm like, Shotton, yeah, some really yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Beastie yeah. Boys, uh, uh, Billy Whitehurst and everybody, you yeah, fucking rushed over. So anyway, we get back into it and we're 1-1. Then we're winning 2-1. And then the last five minutes or so, the ball goes over Alan Kennedy's head. He's chasing back towards goal. Bruce Grobble is coming out towards him. Fucking great goal, Alan Kennedy. <laughs> Top corner, lobs Bruce Grobler into the top corner. 2-2, two -two. Uh, game finishes, 2-2. Two -two. Goes to the dressing room, it's like World War Three. There's blood everywhere, there's fucking Russian still lying on the table, scarred in his eyes, and there's all kinds of things going on. I thought, what the fuck do I come to you? A few things from that day, I realised Bruce Grobler had had 2-2 on the coupon. <laughs> Plus, the words came to fuck me, right? On a Friday night to say this for some years. Phil Neal never played for Liverpool again. Sam Ali never played for Liverpool again. Alan Kennedy never played for Liverpool again. Sammy Lee, when I said, and I said, it's like he said the last supper, I said it is for some years. I often couldn't get me breath because he never played for Liverpool again. So be careful what you say in jest. And that's when Kenny started to be ruthless and go, bang, I'm changing. This is the course of Liverpool Football Club. And we won the double that year. So the rest is, is history. Sadly, Steve, you got injured in the run into the final, didn't you? you to... In the semi finals, I got a, yeah. a, a ripped my hamstring, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I made it to the. To, well, I, play, I, I trained for two days and I played right up until. Obviously, I never even played a game in six weeks. So um, I trained two days before the, the FA Cup final and I, I shouldn't have been in the squad because I, I never played a game at all. But, but Kenny. Um, because I, I used to carry his bags and you know. <laughs> I could understand him as well. Uh, yeah, could uh, I? Uh, <laughs> and I know. I think he liked me. Well, I think he loved me. Um, well, there's a story. So yeah, of course. But I just—it was just nice being on the squad. And he named you as the only sub, didn't he? Well, it was. Uh, that was. There was the last time that there was only one sub yeah. in the FA Cup final. Yeah. Imagine that. Eleven players, one sub. So there was lots of players in, in, in the squad. But Kenny named me as the sub, the only sub. But the only thing is the bastard never brought me on. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter, there's only 12 got medals on, on the occasion. And I was one of them to get a medal on, on that occasion. So I actually won the FA Cup for him twice. And you played your part on you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. All those mentions, and he's talking about the players as if you know them. Bumper, <laughs> Bill. Well, he, he's going Bill, Bumper. Right. Blah, 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 blah. And Peter Beasley comes into the football club. <laughs> Fuck me, it was heaven on the stick. <laughs> it was like, when he seen him, and I went, he is Quasimodo. <laughs> I'm telling you, I said, he has to be fucking Modo. That's his name, Modo. Modo yeah. And he was. So, I named him Modo. He hated it. And the more he hated it, you know, on the playground, when someone gave you a nickname, the more you hated it, the more you got it. Right. So, he was Modo. Even the kids were calling him Modo. And he wanted to strangle him back in the But the first team players called him Modo. Even Kenny named the team. He'd go, Bumper, you're playing. Um, Blue Boy, you're in goal. Uh, Bill, you're playing Stomach Short, yours, and Modo, you're you in. <laughs> I, I kid you not, honestly, so it was Modo. So anyway, after one of his first games, we goes into the players' lounge. And after the game, and Modo's there, 
all the players and wives and models with his missus. So the players and wives are there. And my missus comes over to me and says, do you think we, we should go over and say hello to, um, to Peter and, and his missus? And I said, brilliant, good idea. Take a few of the wives over and just introduce yourself. Make her welcome and being killed. So she starts to walk over and then she turns back to me and says, what's her name? And I said, Esmeralda. <laughs> I fucking kid you not. I thought, she can't be having this. And she's not blonde, my missus, that's all. And I just left it to her. So she goes over with the wife. And oh, I'm cringing, my toes are curling up. And she goes, Hello, oh, this is Julie, this is Elaine, this is so and so, this is oh, whatever. Pleased to meet you, there's my And I've gone, Oh, fuck me. Jack Jordan was, was the tightest man in the world. Jack was tighter than cramp fellas, he was fucking like that. And not what he used to do when he got, when he got the manager's job, uh, 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 he, instead of flying over from Newcastle, he'd get on, get, get on the, in his car and he'd go over to a place in Scotland and get the ferry over to Belfast. And then he'd drive from Belfast to Dublin. And when he got to Belfast, all down the way down to Dublin, he'd pick like four pubs and he'd stop at the pub and he'd go in there and he'd go, oh, Mr. John, what do you want to went here? I'll have a Guinness and, you know, and then they go like that, there you go. He said, I haven't got no, I've got no money on me because the bank's don't open to tomorrow. Will you, will you, will you, will you pay a cheque for me? He said, yes, Mr. John. So we go 50 pounds, which was about 40 quid at the time. And he give them the, the cheque knowing that that was going nowhere other than behind the bar <laughs> and a frame. So by the time he got to the, uh, the airport hotel, he had 200 quid, his air money in his pocket. <laughs> And he didn't spend a thing, he like 10 pounds a thing. He was pissed at Top man, top man, Jack. There's, there's a question going back uh, to Edinburgh Park, playing against the Canada. Yeah. And that's when I realised that you had something special. Do you remember that game? I do, playing because the cause there, was a, there was a bully marking me. And I was only a young kid and he, um, he, 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 he filled me in from behind. <laughs> Oh, so he, was, put your nose. He, he, he smashed me from behind. Um, oh, uh, the dirty bastard, and that's what I like that guy. No. I knew they were both come from somewhere. Now. Some, so, you know, some, 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 some lad, he was, anyway, he was a uh, bully, and he'd just come out of prison, apparently. But he, he um, no, no, he, he did, he did nothing about it, but it, was, it, was, it wasn't good. But he was a shit house because. We played Waterloo Dock uh, at the Cheshire Lions the week, week later and he didn't turn up to play, thankfully, because if, he, if he'd have played that night, he wouldn't have been fucking living the next day, by the way. Because my dad was there with a fucking big sledgehammer and he was smashing. True story, that. That's a true story. But yeah, we, we won the game 1-0. I scored a goal in Actually, extra time. 2-1 it was, John. Was it 2-1? Oh, 2-1. Well, I thought it was 1-0. We went to extra time. That's right, and I got the winner. You got your nose bust. No, no, I was like, you know, teeth and everything to right. yeah. And you scored the, we they was winning one, they you scored the equaliser, we went to extra time, and then this ball come across from Ronnie Jackson, and I was going to say, leave him, and you went, bang, and then I went, he's better than me. <laughs> <laughs> we had great times, didn't we? With, with the, with the Blue Union, the Gas, the Wolf Pitchers, and the Cheshire Lions. Great, great, great. Gentlemen at the back, Ollie, please. Thank you. Oh, he wants a pound. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Although, Steve, is this the uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for tonight. Uh, question. Um, you talked about John Barnes being one of the best players you played with. <laughs> Uh, Steve Gerrard's probably one of the best players me and the young ones on this table have seen. Why is the trouble to make the move into management? So I remember Barnes, he really struggled and had a go at Celtic. You look at Gerrard, he did a good job at Rangers and then it's not going well at Villa. What's the problem? Well, he was the next sensation, Gerrard, wasn't he? So you can't do any better than doing what he did at, at Rangers, his first job. And yeah, it was a big ask to go to, to Villa. 
And everyone said at the time, is it the right move for him? Yes, it was the right move for him, 100%. He didn't deal with situations, so hopefully he's learned by mistakes. He changed the captaincy very quickly. I think he tried to be too much of an influence straight away, instead of just, a bit like Sunes, if you like. He tried to stamp his authority too quickly, instead of weighing up the situation. And with Barnes, he was just fucking useless. Yeah, uh, seriously, he was fucking crap. I, I dig, as I dig as a, him as a You know what Bill's just talking about. Anyway. That's digging with, that's digging with a D. Okay. So, but anyway, Barnsley was absolutely one of the best players, certainly. I played at a time, and, or even better, just let me tell you, even better is when we used to start, I used to love standing next to him in the shower. I'm telling you, he was, he was a black man with a white man's coat. <laughs> Which made me feel very proud. I'm not, he was half an inch, he's half an inch away from being a woman. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that, next to Barnes in the shower. Imagine. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, anyway, that's enough. Gentlemen over there, I think. Uh, no. Steve, you yes. in the 86 in his Yes. Yeah. Steve, you and the Argentina again. You the Argentina. 86? Yeah. No. <laughs> I don't know Steve. You think I'm fucking Steve McManaman, don't you? <laughs> And he wasn't even there. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't go 86 World Cup. No. So next question. I didn't fucking go. Trust me. And so any argue me saying I did. I didn't. One last round there, Ali. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Steve, Steve, I'm here. Alright, okay. Going back to 88 Cup final, Billy Jones is always gobbing off. He taught you a lesson. Did he? I oh, smashed it, didn't he? He fucking smashed it. He didn't play well in the first half, but did he? Hey, come on, Bill. It's a load of bollocks. It's a deal. What he said is that trying to smash me in the first 30 seconds. That's what won Wimbledon the FA Cup, right? Because you tried to clear me out within 30 seconds. You never felt it. I, no, I didn't. I, I rolled the tackle and, and, and got up and just walked away. What, what cost us that FA Cup final was this fucking one <laughs> thing. Did you to set me up? <laughs> Because, Bastard. because he was the first player to ever miss a fucking penalty Shit. in an FA Cup final. All right? I'll tell you something. That's, no, I'm, 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 true or false? True or false? True. 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 That's why I hate it. Wood. Yeah, so anyway, right, right, right. okay, so the Vinny Jones, just let me hang in you kid. Yeah, Vin, the Vinny Jones, Jones had him like, so like Vin, he had him in his ass pocket, to tell you what. He was his bitch for 90 minutes. Uh, <laughs> He was, uh, and they all would have allowed it. Yeah. Absolutely. Modo, Modo, not people busy. Modo scored a good goal, it wasn't offside. Stones missed the penalty, first ever penalty missed. So I blame him. I do as well. Can I just tell you something which is, is really, you no, know, this, this is like. Um, he wants to know the Vinnie Jones fucking. No, no, uh, you uh, just saw him and smash your fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you come back in a minute. But, but that, that penalty um, wasn't a miss. It was the best save I've ever seen in my fucking life, by the way. But okay, no, right, it wasn't a miss, it was a fucking save. That was my last touch of the game. I must tell you this one because it, 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 Kenny, Kenny decided to put Craig Johnson on and score two goals that year and take me off. 
you know. So why did Ken let you go? Oh, no, 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 let me have a say. So that was my last touch in 88. Right. Roll the ball forward, forward a year, year forward, 89. The odds were found against Everton. Listen to this. Listen to this. They had kick off. So I didn't have to kick off. My first touch was in four minutes and it was in the same place the ball went where the penalty should have gone, which is nuts. It was a great pass from Matthew to me. The only time he's ever fucking paid past the ball. Right in the top corner. I felt sorry for you because I realised you cost us the FA Cup final. I know, but I was so, you know, When it went through on goal. My goal was got beat 1 0. So when it went through on goal, I was like, oh, fucking hell, I'll give it to all of them. And to be fair, he slotted the top corner. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. But the, the, the story about Vinnie John. We're talking about, we're talking about him being Vinnie's bitch now, aren't we? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm you. So, so I'm Vinnie's that bitch. Game, okay. That game wiped that penalty. That game wiped that penalty, Michelle. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. <laughs> because we'd have won the double that year again. So, uh, so Vinnie John. So I'm thinking, okay, he says after the game. The tackle on me was what won Wimbledon the FA Cup, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was fucking in this penalty. So anyway, six months, six days, six minutes and 14 seconds later, roughly. <laughs> Give it a second. We placed them out here at Anfield and we always go to the hotel pretty much Friday evenings and and we get our rest and everything else. But this night, I mean, I sleep like a log all the time. And this night, I'm thinking fucking Vinnie Jones. I'm thinking Vinnie Jones. Vinnie Jones. You're fucking having it. If I get a chance, he's having it. And I couldn't get him out of my fucking mind. He thought, if I get a chance, he is having it. Now, the game kicks off. 60 minutes. 16 seconds into the game. 16 minutes. 16, did I? Okay, sorry for that. Okay. Yeah. Roughly. I said roughly. And you shit yourself. Yeah. So, the ball bounces. It gets, if, if you look at the YouTube, you'll see what happens. The ball gets knocked out. I want to edge the box. And it gets knocked out. And you've got Vinnie Jones, who's about six yards away from me, and myself going towards the ball. The ball's in the middle. He couldn't go fucking anywhere. He couldn't go backwards. He couldn't go sideways. And I thought, oh, fucking happy birthday. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Happy birthday. You name it. It's on a plate. You're getting it. You're getting it. And he fucking got it. Okay? So, the ball, I don't know where to put on it. The referee was there and he just turned away and went, oh fuck. <laughs> now, ser seriously, if you, if you Google it and you see it, then I smashes him and he falls on the floor like a bag of shit. <laughs> so it goes on the floor. And then, quickly he gets up. He's up, like a shot. And the video goes off. When the video goes off, within a few seconds, he's gone down again. He's fucked. <laughs> Stretches on, and he's off. On the stretcher, I'm thinking, go on, good there, fucking good lad. Hey, off you go, no problem. He goes in, half time, the doc sidles up to me and says, good news, Mucket. And I went, uh, what is it? He went, he's crying his eyes out. <laughs> I said, who? He went, Vinny. I said, he's screaming your name out, back, back, man, bastard, the fucking back. And he said, he's crying. I said, why? He said, uh, I put 22 stitches in his shin. Yeah. And I went, you'll do for me, dog. No problem. <laughs> so I never, ever spoke to him, seen him again. I never even mentioned him again until that time, but redemption was sweet. Yeah, yeah, Just let me tell you. And now he's doing what he should have been doing in the first place. Fucking acting. <laughs> That's what he should have been doing. Yeah, and then in millions and millions as well. Thank you for that, Steve. Thanks, thanks for both of them having you in stitches. Not just Vinnie Jones. Uh, <laughs>
uh, to John Aldridge and Steve McMahon. Uh, thank you very much indeed for being yeah. our guest tonight. It's been absolutely great. And I just, I just like to say very quickly that on our table is a man who's been known quite rightly as the voice of Anfield, Mr. George Sefton. Yeah. Thank you for being a great audience, John Beerman, editor of Red All Over the Land for 27 years. Now, along those years, John, Liverpool has got a lot of celebrity fans, it's to be fair. In fact, a lot more recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah they've come sailing up the Mersey on their yachts. Yes. Yeah, they've just made a billion pounds doing something, thinking about buying a club, and then they, uh, they come to one game a year, get introduced, and everyone will round a round of applause, and then they go back to doing what they were doing for yes. 12 months. But there are some fans who you've decided are celebrities because they're proper fans of, of Liverpool Football Club. They certainly are. And uh, just take your mind back. You just take your mind back to 1994, uh, 1994, the last day of the cop. You must remember it. Jeremy Gosh. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, we don't need him there though. He couldn't make it. But um, the club, the club, Liverpool Football Club, claimed that as a fantastic achievement. The thing is, they had nothing to do with it. That was organised by a gent who's over there, and is, uh, I'm proud to call him a real good mate, almost a neighbour now since we moved to Chester, and that's John Mackin. John, stand up and take a bow, please, John. John Mackin. Um, so, thank you for the last day of call. This is how it all evolved. He, he just um, reintroduced what I thought was fan atmosphere in Anfield. He'd gone a bit dead. And uh, then when John came along with his flag days, the cop reinvented itself. We even had the Boss Friday agreement, didn't we, John? Yeah. So, yeah, the man that got the flags back on the cop, John Mackin. So the next one is a bloke who we've mentioned earlier, the voice of Anfield. The voice of Anfield is George, you all know him. <laughs> 1971 on. What a, what a career. You've lasted longer than how many managers and how many... I don't know. But I'll tell you what, George, I wish you could do the pitch of team announcements, because... Uh, don't so we all wish that could happen again? Do it properly instead of this American razzmatazz style they've got now, and shouting. <laughs> oh, you... You only have to give the team out, you know, it's not... <laughs> but it used to be a lot better when it was the Liverpool team is as per programme, didn't it? <laughs> so things have moved on. Now you have to name about 15, uh, 11 players and 15 subs, so yeah. things have changed. Yeah. Okay, the next bloke is a banner man. The banner man is Peter Carney, he's around here somewhere. If you just stand up, or is he at the bar? Oh, he's yeah, over he there, he's near the bar. Yeah. And uh, one of the most famous banners we've seen is the, uh, the Hillsborough banner. You know the one, and that is where Peter, that's one of Peter's and he's done so many and they're even on the cop today, the uh, Jürgen Believers and many others and the one that's behind you on We Love You Liverpool We Do, again Peter and thanks for bringing that along Pete. And Pete actually hung them up today as well to make sure that the place looked perfect. Yeah and, the, uh, and this one here the destiny delivered and I like that one of our own that's a real fantastic banner and I've been told that that banner is going to do a world tour and uh, is it the FIFA Museum? The FIFA Museum are taking that all over America and it's going on tour so that's how famous the Liverpool banners are There's, um, there's another banner that you may remember, and that was uh, back in 1977. 
and it's now known as Liverpool's version of the Turin Shroud, the Scouse Bay Tapestry, the most famous banner in football. And tonight we actually have it with us. And we're going to try and hold it up. We can't, the thing is, it's 18 foot long. So you'll recognise it. You'll recognise it when you see it. Do you want to do it now? <laughs> it's a priceless artifact. It's a prize. Come on, bring it up now. Go show it. We need a couple of people to come and help us hold this up. And if you want your photo taken with it, now's your chance. This is the original. So if you want your photo, if you want a photo of it, hurry up. John's banner. Yeah, the, famous, the most famous banner in football. Thanks, Adam. Thank you very much again. Adam Downey, whose staff made the original banner, this original banner. This is the original. We don't do substitutes here. We only have the real thing. Just brilliant. Okay, John, so we mentioned uh, John Mackin earlier, and he's got a partner in crime who put something special out a little while ago. Yes, back in uh, 2009, there was a book come out called Season on the Drink, um, followed by uh, a few headaches and all that, and there's uh, Jegsy Dodd there, put, wave your arm. Hey! Thank you very much. There it is. Look at John Mackin put that book out, especially if you read that one. Now we were supposed to have Kev Sampson here tonight, who is the bloke who wrote the the miniseries Anne, which everybody in this room must have seen and been moved by. But Kev's done a bit of a Mulby tonight. <laughs> he's uh, he's at the it's the Royal Television Society Award, so he couldn't make it tonight. But his brother Neil is here. Where's Neil? Yeah. Oh, okay. I've gone to the loo. Gone to the loo. Perfect timing. Perfect yeah. timing. So, yeah, and we've got members of the uh, Anne production team here. And if you watched that, and I'm sure you did, it's not just moving. It also, once again, raised awareness of what happened on that fateful day so many years ago. And the fight for justice. And the fight for justice, and really tremendous. We've got... <laughs> it's a pity Kevin can't be here, but we, the one thing that make everything, cap, cap everything tonight, if Anne gets the honours that it deserves. Yeah. And Kevin, fantastic. <laughs> And, and Martin Thompson is here tonight um, from the family who lived next door but one to Kev as well. So, where's Martin? Hey, thank you very much. Can we hear it from Martin who's here? That was, Thanks for coming. Is, yeah, this was all because, uh, because Kev Sampson arranged all this. And uh, we've got members of Anne's family and uh, people from the, the HSA, the Hillsborough Survivors and Supporters Association. So, thanks for coming to There we are. Just to give a quick interlude, um, we've still got raffle tickets if anybody wants to buy any. We've got them before we do the, uh, the prize draw, and then of course the auction. But there's another guy here tonight who. Um, did so much for Liverpool fans, 
and wrote a fantastic, uh, or produced a fantastic little film called One Night in Istanbul. Does anybody remember Istanbul? In 2005. And that's uh, Dave Kirby. Thing. I just want to also um, welcome... You, you, may, you may remember Liverpool manager from the 60s who did quite well. Well, we've got the uh, granddaughter of the great Bill Shankly with us tonight. Istanbul, but there's another night in uh, 2019 when Liverpool had to, to overturn a 3-0 deficit against Barcelona. Now, we've heard a few stories, but John Williams, a local, another local lad who now lives in Leicester, who I've known for 20 odd years, he wrote a book called Red Men Reborn, and there's a chapter in it about the Barcelona night. So come on, John, bring your book up. Come on, then. Let's see. Uh, and we're going to see a clip on this one as well, aren't we, John? recognise John Perman and the uh, and the fanzine. I've written a couple of books, well I've written quite a few books actually about the club, a couple of books about its history, Red Men in 2010 at the very moment that the club's future was under threat and then just this year Red Men Reborn. Why did I write Red Men Reborn? Because Bill Shankly is back. He's German <laughs> but he has Of Bill Shanklin, does he? He has all those values that we, we so pride ourselves about in this club. It's so fantastic to have him back. Um, I wrote the first book, Red Men, because I wanted to talk about the history of the club before Bill Shanklin. Because so few people knew about that history, so I wanted to talk about the 1901 and 06 championship teams, Alex Raisbeck, Tom Watson, the great manager, the first great football manager in Britain, who managed that team. I wanted to talk about the 22 and 23 championship teams. I wanted to talk particularly about Elisha Scott. We love our goalkeeper now, Alison, he's a fantastic goalkeeper, but I've no doubt Elisha Scott is the greatest goalkeeper this club has ever had. Elisha, Elisha Scott virtually invented the cop in 1930. His, his relationship and his communication with the cop gave it its special status. So I wanted to write about that. I also wanted to write about the club's desperation to win the FA Cup. Because after it won the championship in 1901, the only trophy it wanted to win then was the FA Cup. Why? Because it was only in the 1920s that the Football League became national. So that every club wanted to win the FA Cup. Liverpool got to the final in 1914, didn't win it, but lost to Burnley in the final. Then they got to the final again in 1950. And just to show you how different the game was in 1950 to how it is today, this is the most important match in the entire history of the club. The club double booked a hotel on the night before the match. So Kevin Barron, one of the players, had to sleep in a hall on a made up bed on the night before the game because of the disarray. Before the match, Liverpool had to change its kit and they hadn't arranged it so that when they played a league match in Portsmouth, 
They sent one of the coaching assistants out to a shop in Portsmouth to buy some socks they could wear in the final, and the only socks they could wear were white with blue hoops. So we played in blue for the, for the FA Cup final in 1950. Just incredible, and more incredible still, the guy who lifted the FA Cup that year for Arsenal, Joe Mercer, had been trained by Liverpool in the week before the final. Because Joe Mercer lived in Liverpool, and he, he needed preparation before the game, and our club offered him preparation before the final. So they gave him people to train with during that week. Just an amazing story. He was the guy who lifted the cup. All of the Liverpool players knew him because they'd seen him around the coaching area for the week before. That's how different the game is compared to, to what it's like today. So uh, I wrote the second book, Red Men Reborn, as I said, because Shankly's back. Uh, he's German. Who could imagine that a German would be leading this club in the way that Shankly did back in the 1960s? I also said I was on a, a couple of podcasts this week for the Anfield Rap and Red Men TV, and I said, because someone mentioned to me earlier, Ron, uh, how do we decide who is the greatest player in the world? And normally what happens, we say, who's, who plays up front, who's got the great skill, who can do the hardest thing in the game, and that is score goals. But another way of deciding who is the greatest player in the world is to say, could he play in everybody else's position? Could he do that? Maybe except goalkeeper, because that is such a specialist position. Could he play in everyone else's position and play better than he could? Stephen Gerrard. Stephen Gerrard. He could. He could play. He could play in any position, outfield position on the field and be better than the guy already playing in that position. So, I have bought with me, I brought with me 10 copies of Red Men Reborn, the story of this amazing match, and believe me, I've, I've looked at the entire history of the club. I was in Istanbul when we won in 2005, but I have absolutely no doubt that the match in 2019, when we beat Barcelona 4-0, is the greatest match this club has ever played. the greatest match any British club has ever played. It was absolutely magnificent. And I can tell you, I was on the cop that night, and when that fourth goal went in, half the cop missed it, because we didn't know what was happening. Jürgen Klopp missed it. He didn't know what was happening. This kid, this kid who people criticize so much now, this amazing kid, Trent Alexander-Arnold, possibly the most gifted footballer I've ever seen at this club, who people disrespect now. naturally gifted footballer I've ever seen at this club does something in this game that you would see at Everton Park on a Saturday morning produces this amazing piece of work for this winning goal and I can tell you on the cop and this is my final thing on the cop there were men around me crying when this ball when this goal went in at the end of the game there were men around me crying and I can tell you, because of the work that I've done, they were doing the same in 1901 when we won the title. They were doing the same in 1937 when Elisha Scott made his departure speech in front of the cop. They were doing the same in 1964 when Bill Shankly brought the league title back to Liverpool, the second trophy in 40 odd years. And of course they did it in 65 too. They were doing it in 77 in Istanbul, at, at uh, Rome, when I was there, I was crying. The first time we won the European Cup in Rome. Of course we were doing it in 1989 for different reasons, completely. So that connection, that emotional 
connection that we have with this club is what is important. That is why this manager is important, because he has an emotional connection with all of us. Can I, uh, can I just interrupt the whole uh, auction thing here? This is amazing, amazing news. Kevin Sampson has just won at the British Television Awards for the Anne Documentary on Channel 4. Fucking get in there! Come on! Fucking get in Absolutely brilliant. This is for us. This is for us. For everyone here, this is for us. So, we just won now in London. Documentary around on Channel 4. Brilliant.